trustees from the Mark Consolidated Independent School District is called to order at 6.30 p.m. This is our board workshop being held on February 18, 2020. We have a quorum with all our members present. We will review the agenda items for the regular board meeting on February 9th, the 20th, 2020. But tonight we are going to start first we can with a presentation from the TASB pay study process. So if we could have. Yes, Madam President, yes. Jennifer Barton and Amy Campbell uh, will present their uh, pay study okay. at this time. And uh, because they are having to drive back to Austin, uh, okay. we appreciate your willingness to let them uh, do theirs first. We're fine. Thank you. Right, let me see if I can get this in. All right. Good evening. I think we're good there. All right, good evening. I am Jennifer Barton with uh, TASB HR Services, and Amy Campbell sitting back there in the back. She'll wave hi. Um, she's here for moral support, and just in case she needs to jump in, she can. Uh, so I just want to thank Dr. Randall and thank the board for having us come and do the pay study process. We are here to share just some brief information about our process this year and some of our recommendations that we have provided for the district. And, and because this is a workshop format, we're definitely here to answer questions. Um, I try to have workshop format be as informal as possible. That way you can feel like you can ask some questions and hopefully I can answer all of those questions. We'll see. <laughs> um, so we're going to briefly go over just the pay study process and then we're going to get into the specifics for Lamar. All right. So when we have uh, we do a pay study with a district, we have a process that we go through pretty much similar for all of our districts. We do data collection. Um, I visited the district. I did some interviews with district staff, with Dr. Randall. Um, we do kickoff discussions with the district to really talk about what are the strategic initiatives for the year, what are we looking at for compensation, what are some of the goals for the district. That way we know what to address through our market analyses as well as through our recommendations for the district. Um, we have an analyst that works on the project, and they do a lot of data collection from the district. We ask for pay files, all different kinds of information about jobs and positions in the district and all of those things. So that's where our um, collection comes in. And then we work on building models for improvement where we align pay structures. We make sure that those pay structures are competitive. We make sure that the internal hierarchy with pay is aligned, that everything looks great, and that we stay competitive within the market for um, compensation of your employees. <clears throat> so when we do a project, basically we have four things that we're focusing on. Obviously, we have a pay system in place to recruit and retain employees. Those are the big goals for a district. But we also want to make sure that we're paying for the job value, that market price for the job, and that we're not really overpaying or underpaying anybody too much with that job, as well as controlling costs, and which is always um, important to the board because you are obviously, um, you know, really Im mindful about the budget, and that's the most important point, part. So these are the four things that we do um, whenever we're looking at the pay system. So when we're thinking... Yeah, some of our stuff's not showing up. So this should be a target right here. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, the bullseye is we're looking at that market rate. So that would be the middle of your target, if you can think of that analogy. So our market rate is based on your geographic um, geographical area, which we will talk about here in just a minute for Lamar, um, and where those jobs fall with market rate. We consider jobs market competitive within 90% to 110% of market. So if market is the bullseye, anyone that ranges 10% above or 10% below is considered a market competitive salary. When we get a little bit concerned or things that we want to make sure that we're addressing is when we have those outliers where we're going below that 90% or maybe even above. And there's a lot of reasons why those jobs might fall below or above. It could be how the district values um, the you know, the position. Um, it could be that that person has 40 years of experience. It could be maybe that person's brand new to the position. So there's a lot of reasons. So it's not necessarily concerning that we have jobs um, way above or way below, but it is something that we want to be mindful of and making sure that we're addressing if we feel like there's concern. So the other part of our, you know, um, pay system is we have pay grades. And so within each pay grade, we have a group of jobs. And so typically our pay grades go from level one, which is maybe your lowest pay grade in that sense, all the way up through several pay grades. And it just, you know, it increases with responsibility, decision making, all of those things. So we just group those jobs. And then we want to make sure that they're aligned around that market midpoint. 
and then we have the minimum and maximum rates of each pay range. And so we want employees to fall basically within those boxes if at all, po at all possible. And so whenever we align our structures, we want to make sure that those structures are competitive and that most of the employees, if not all, are all scooped within those boxes. So again, and the, luckily, Lamar does this really well. Our strategies, we assess job value accurately, so really looking at those market competitive rates. You keep the pay ranges competitive to make sure all those employees are scooped in there and with, or within that 90% to 110%. We control the pay spread between job incumbents, so we don't want everybody right there at market rate. We want to make sure there's a good spread in between, so that way employees have the opportunity to move towards that midpoint, and then as they become more veteran, they can have those higher salaries. We want to accelerate employees to market pay and then budget sufficiently, obviously, for pay increases, and that's a lot of your job. Any questions on just the pay review process? Okay. All right, so here are the market districts. So obviously, being in the Houston area, Lamar is in a very competitive market. And as you can see, we have some districts that are very large that you compete with, as well as um, some districts that are not so big, but that is your market, and this is very similar market to most districts in the Houston area. And this market was decided on in collaboration with um, district administration. Other market sources, we use statewide enrollment for some of our directors and above, and we also have third-party vendors that TASB um, pays for where we provide or we get data for non-school market. Sometimes we will combine local school market and the non-school market of jobs that we see not only in the school districts but maybe right down the road. And so we use a lot of different data sources to make sure that we're matching those jobs appropriately and that we have um, appropriate competitive pay for those jobs. So this is where we get to have a lot of praise for the district and for the school board. Uh, Lamar is very competitive in their teacher salaries, and that's where we want to be. Um, teachers make up the largest portion of a staff in a district, and so we want to make sure that those teacher salaries are competitive. And so Lamar is the orange line, and you have the local market median, which is the market that we just looked at. The median, the middle of that, is the blue line. And as you can see, Lamar is above. And so if you were to put this graphic into numbers, you can see that Lamar is competitive across the board. So the difference from market, you have 2% at that beginning salary of 57,100, and then 102% at five years, 101% at 10 years, 102% at 15, and then 103 at 20. So during our project, we benchmark at those years, so we can see how staff or how teachers are competitive at those years. And you can see that you have really worked to keep this competitive, and after House Bill 3, to be where you are in the market, that's a huge deal. That's a great thing. So you can pat yourself on the back for that, because that's great. And I'm sure your teachers truly appreciate it, um, because there were a lot of mandates. Not all districts got a lot of money, and so this is a, a, good, a very good thing. We also look at teaching area stipends. You have great base salaries for your teachers, so this might not be an area that's as big of a concern for the district, so that you see that you don't have a lot of other stipends here, these teaching area stipends that Lamar does not offer some of those, and that's okay, because you offer really competitive base salaries. However, if there are areas here that maybe district administration or the school board believes, you know, we're really struggling to recruit some of those teachers or those quality teachers or to retain them, then this is somewhere where maybe you can add a stipend to help um, with those hard to fill areas. So right now you do offer the general master's degree, which is pretty standard for most school districts. And then you offer the bilingual stipend at 3850 and the median stipend is 4000 We always say put as much money as you can to bilingual because the test is very difficult and it's very difficult to find those type of teachers. Um, so that is an area that you could increase. We are seeing just across the board, across the state, that special education teachers are harder to find and to keep, and so that might be an area um, that we might address through the district. And then we will talk about other stipends as we get to our recommendations. When we look at other exempts, so this would be your administrative professional groups, 
Um, we look at those market salaries. We have the central administration, campus administration, we have a technology group, and then professionals. And so overall, as you can see, employee pay is competitive as well as the um, pay grade midpoint to market, which is your pay structure. So overall, this is very competitive group. Again, just efforts of the district and efforts of the school board to keep those that pay uh, competitive. So this is a good thing here too. And one thing to note with technology, it is a combined of hourly and um, professional or exempt, but still you are competitive there. And technology is kind of a special snowflake, and sometimes it's hard to stay competitive with those jobs, but the district is at this time. Non-exempt are more your hourly employees, and so when we look at those salaries, you can see that clerical and technical and auxiliary are competitive as well as their, their pay structures. Where we see that uh, probably need to address some pay is with instructional support, and these are going to be like your classroom aides. And so more specifically within that group where our concern is is the special education aides. And so with um, discussions with the district, we are going to address some of these um, through our recommendations and putting some pay towards some of our special education aides to get their pay up. Um, but you can see the 98%, their pay range is competitive. It's just more about making sure that we're bumping their pay. The other thing that we did um, analyze in this project was your curric extra curricular stipends, extra duty stipends. So we look at athletics as well as performing arts and some academic um, activities. And so what we do with stipends, which is a little bit different than our general pay study, is we look at dollar difference for market. And so the differentials um, are in dollars instead of percentages. So the closer to zero, zero dollars that you are is the more competitive that you are. So you can see that performing arts is pretty far below there, $1,147. Athletics is closer as well as academics. But that's another area that we did address through the pay study. And so these are our recommendations. So we always recommend that we, the district implements the pay structure adjustments to align with market. So we want to make sure that those pay structures are competitive so that way all of the employees can be scooped within those pay ranges and we don't have anybody being an outlier or there's only very few if we have that. We have five structures, so teacher, administrative, professional, technology, clerical, paraprofessional, auxiliary. You saw all of the market for those groups, and so we went ahead and we adjusted their pay structures. We improved starting salaries, and that's very important, especially with your hourly employees, because they do compete with a lot of the hourly jobs in your community. So making sure starting salaries are strong. We're aligning the midpoints with the market rates, as we talked about, so that bullseye, and then making sure that the jobs are aligned appropriately within the structures and making sure that we have the career pathways intact. So, for example, secretaries have a career pathway. Um, your administrators have a career pathway. Making sure that we have all of those aligned so that way there is opportunity for that promotional pathway for a lot of those positions because that's important so that way you can retain um, employees in the district. We also recommend that we adopt a general pay increase, which is this is something that your district already does. So we recommended two models, a 2% for all job groups, including teachers, and a 3% for all job groups. Uh, for the teacher structure, the general pay increase, or GPI, is calculated as a percentage of the market median salary. And then for the other pay group, excuse me, other pay groups, the GPI is calculated as a percentage of the employee's pay grade midpoint. This is not anything different than what you already do. We also recommend uh, some adjustments. And so adjustments are one of those that some of them are optional and some of them are maybe not as optional, but this helps get um, individual employee pay to be more competitive, making sure that we are addressing any internal inequities that we may have um, and making sure that you know pay is aligned where it should be. So for anybody, after we give the general pay increase, if their salary is still below the minimum of the pay grade, then we go ahead and give them 1% above minimum to move them further into the pay grade. We also give targeted adjustments for select pay groups, which is 1% of midpoint if they're more than 10% below. So if anybody that's below that 90%, if we find that um, they're there, we want to give them another 1% to move them further to that market rate. 
educator career pathway adjustment. So these are going to be your counselors and administrators, such as APs, principals. We want to make sure that they are at least even or above what a teacher would be making. So we recommend 2% above. That's a good starting rate. And then placement scale adjustments for clerical, paraprofessional, and auxiliary groups in select pay grades. So those placement scale adjustments are going to help spread out the, those employees within that pay grade and alleviate any compression we may have. This is a little more general recommendation, but we um, are recommending that the district may consider to offer stipends for those hard-to-fill teaching assignments. So again, as I mentioned before, special education teacher stipends, we're just seeing that those are more difficult to recruit quality teachers and keep them, so that might be an area that the district would want to explore. And then through our discussions with the district, um, they are struggling a little bit with recruiting and keeping uh, secondary English language arts teachers. And so TASB doesn't benchmark for that particular teaching area stipend. However, we are noticing that a lot of districts across the state are starting to find, not be able to find these type of teachers. So typically we've had secondary math and science we've given a lot of stipends for in the past because it was really difficult to get those type of positions. But what we're finding is that ELR is becoming harder to find. And so that might be another area that the district would want to explore, maybe research, and see what they can offer. These are more general. We do not give dollar amounts because this really needs to be based on what the district needs to meet their goals. adjust extracurricular duty stipends in a targeted manner to match competitive rates, and we also want to preserve internal equity. So when, through our analyses, we increased 64 stipends that were below market median pay values and decreased 14 stipends to better align with market pay. The decrease were mostly athletic uh, stipends, but it was more to have a very consistent athletic um, stipend schedule. So that way head coaches make um, market competitive um, stipends as well as your assistance and so on and so forth. So we just want to make sure that we're more standardized across stipends. It's more transparent. It's more equitable. Um, that also goes with the second recommendation where we're recommending that the district replace the practice of paying duty days by offering one single aligned market stipend value, which pays for all the duties required of the position. That way, the stipend is a flat rate across the board, um, and it's more equitable, more transparent. It's able to be communicated to coaches, and you're able to recruit um, and retain those coaches a little easier um, than whenever you're paying days. And then because we are recommending some decrease in stipends and we're moving hopefully away from paying the duty days, we want to recommend that the district consider grandfathering employees whose stipends are above market value. So that way they do not have any decrease in pay. We would just enact those flat rate stipends when we would hire someone new. So we don't want anybody to lose pay because of that. So that may be something to consider. For anybody that, once we've given the general pay increase and we've given adjustments for anybody that's above the maximum of that pay grade, um, we do recommend that there's strong pay discipline for employees. Again, that is a district decision. There are several ways that you can go about it. Um, you can freeze pay, although that's not all usually the, the best option. Employees don't like their pay frozen. Um, there are other strategies that the district can employ, such as giving a one-time payment of that increase. They could give half of that. Um, so there's a lot of different things that the district can do in order to make sure that we are managing those, those employees that are above the maximum. And then our last recommendation is to continually in, uh, to review district compensation plan, update as needed, and Lamar does a great job with that. Um, and so just continue doing all of the great work that has been happening. And so we do have the two cost models that we recommended to the district. I'll let you look at those. So as you can see, our 2%, so the general pay increase would be 2% across the board for every em continuing employee. We treat uh, our extra duty stipends actually as adjustments because they are not a percentage of a pay increase. And then the estimated total increase. And then the 3%. I know that was quick, and I talk fast, so definitely do you have questions or anything that you'd like for me to go over? I was speedy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know you have a lot on your agenda. All right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. You. If you need anything, just let the district know. Need to thank you. Some of this. No, I'm sure. <laughs> but, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're fine. 
uh, special education. Yes, ma'am. Um, you're saying not just here but everywhere it's getting more and more difficult to recruit good, experienced yes. people. Yes, ma'am. Are there other ways that I'm uh, – what I'm looking at is just a blank here where it says special education on page six. Mm -hmm. At the present time, we don't have anything set up. As a, as In the district. Incentive. Correct. So the district currently does not offer a teaching area stipend for special education teachers. So that may be an area. Oops, sorry. Um, you know, that the district may want to explore. So right now, the market median for those uh, stipends, so for a general resource teacher, someone that is helping with, you know, those resource minutes or is in a general education classroom helping students in special education is $1,500, $1,500. Um, for a self-contained, we're thinking more of like your life skills classes, maybe your behavior type classes, those classes where students have um, unique challenges that maybe are a little bit more difficult. And so the market Market median for that stipend is 2000 So that could be a starting point. It really would depend on, you know, the issues that the district is having with those particular teachers. But teaching special education is a really tough job. I was a former principal, and I actually have a background in special education, too. So it's just a really tough job. Um, and that's another reason why we're really looking at supporting those special education aides, right? And that we looked at that in another um, – with the, the, the hourly. Mm -hmm, the paras, correct. Because we know that those jobs are very difficult. So compensation is one way that we can help recruit and retain with some of those um, teachers. But districts can do other things, too, to help with that. Counselors, what category do they fall under? So your counselors are going to be in your other exempt groups and in your professionals. So they're going to be within that group, school counselors. And how are we doing on that? So um, overall, they are competitive. I mean, we do look on, on the report with the district. We look individually. We don't have that market breakdown here, but the district can definitely let you know about that. But overall, they're competitive. That group of professional, that's on average the whole group is competitive. Um, but I don't have the actual counselors on hand tonight. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we, we can get you that information. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? This is definitely the time to ask. Workshop. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank Have you. a good evening. Yes. Dr. Randall, we continue with our action items. Yes, ma'am, Madam President. <coughs> <coughs> Next item is approval of student trip requests. We ask the board to approve out-of-state travel for George Ranch High School, school Larry Ed dance team to travel to Los Angeles, California. Next item, we ask the board to approve out-of-state travel for Terry High School to acquire to travel to Orlando, Florida. The next item, we ask the board to approve the updated memorandum of understanding between the Houston Galveston Institute Counseling and Lamar Consolidated Independent School District for Mental Health Services provided for students and families and authorized the superintendent to execute the agreement. Okay. Yes. We've got some questions. Questions on that? Um, uh, come on up, guys. Dr. Rappers, all you guys. Come on up. Empty <laughs> podium. Oh, no. I'm ready. Um, the special ed. It's about special ed. So those teachers are also able to utilize this service. Is that correct? So are you asking, <clears throat> could a student who's in special ed also utilize this service? Teacher. A teacher. Is in, oh, so when you're talking about the, uh, when it talks about HGI working with teachers and yes. supporting teacher burnout, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. And that's not necessarily helping us retain special ed teachers. But this could be used with special ed could teachers, yes. Yes. Is this the first time we're doing this agreement? With them? No. No. Yeah. So it's, al it's already been in place? Yes. And those teachers know how to go about making an appointment with, with these folks? This is, so the, yeah, so um, with HGI, they really just support um, students. If a teacher were in need and there was a therapist on site and they were available to see the teacher, they, they would absolutely have access. But it's not like an EAP. 
So it's not like an employee assistance program that's, that's on the campus, which we have access to for, for those teachers. But if, um, if a teacher was in need on campus and that HGI therapist was there and was available, we would want to do whatever we could to support that teacher to get them the help they needed. I was just looking at the wording on page 17. It says HGI therapists will also be available to work with teachers and administrators, staff regarding burnout and challenges in the classroom. That sounds like special yeah. ed to me. So, oh, so uh, thank you for thank you for reading that. So, um, let me tell you when they they will collaborate with the administration and with counselors to provide in services, to provide strategies, um, to get sort of a feel of what's going on on the campus. And if they say you know we're struggling with this, then they use them as a as a resource. Yeah. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, I had a question, and I don't know if this relates to what HDI does, but um, I was recently met with my son's counselor at George Ranch, and I know that during the two weeks where they're doing schedule, they meet with them during those two weeks, and she mentioned that her time is really taken up with just doing um, future schedules. And so I was curious as to... Um, are they able to assist the students that need counseling during those two weeks, or how does that work? So um, the best practice is that um, there's a rotation um, of scheduling the students to meet one-on-one -on -one with their counselor to go through to make sure that their courses are correct and that there's a counselor available in the counseling suite to see students as they, as they come through. It's not in every class period, um, but there's access to counselors 100%, or there should be, um, during the course selection process. Um, but they do have quite a few kids to see right. um, to make sure that course selection is accurate and that they are in line to meet their endorsement requirements. But is this is something that I guess that they would be able to assist in if they felt oh, like the, the HGI were pulled away too much? Too much? Uh, you're talking about the right. HGI therapist? Yeah. Um, not particularly with regards to that. So in the high schools, and we'll talk a little bit about this too, um, there are to see the HGI therapist, they're referred by the school counselor or the teacher or administrator, and they set up almost like an, an appointment okay. um, so that we have kids that are pulled at the appropriate time and that it's very organized and um, scheduled, per se. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, this is a mental health service. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's, yes, ma'am. That's away from scheduling yes, for the students. So they're not necessarily there unless the, the request is there for them to come? So the, the, the HGI, depending on the campus, the HGI the therapist is there, but um, they're one person, and so they have a list based on the referral and the need um, to schedule which kid, which student would be able to see the, the therapist at, at a designated time. Um, but they are there, um, again, depending on the campus, um, for that access. And also for the teachers? Sure. Yeah. <coughs> One question, I'm just curious. Uh, do you know, uh, have our teachers been able to use, has this been used at any given time by teachers? Yes, ma'am. I can tell you that on campus, the campus where there's an HGI therapist and it had there be a, uh, or there was a teacher need and they knew that the, that the therapists were there, I, I do know that there have been campuses where teachers have had access. Yes, ma'am. I just have one more question. Um, can parents request their child see this or does it have to come from the student or teacher? Absolutely. Okay. The parents That's can, can have it. And okay. usually it's a collaboration with the school counselor and the parents and okay. sometimes administration, you bet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next item, we ask the board to ratify the financial and investment reports. The next item, we ask the board to consider approval of budget amendment request. The next item, we ask the board to approve the attached resolutions proclaiming March 2 through 6 as Texas Educational Diagnostics Week. The next item, we ask the board to approve the resolution for Texas Public School Week. The next item, we ask the board to ratify donations to the district. And Frost PTO is, has a donation. The next item, we ask the board uh, to consider approve. 
that the board approve the uh, student staff instructional calendar for 2020-2021 as recommended by the DSIC. Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you'd like, I could provide a quick overview of the process for this school year. So traditionally, uh, we have utilized the District-Wide Student Improvement Council, or the DSIC, as our calendar committee, with the exception of last school year where we used a district-wide survey. So we brought an information item to the school board in October, as you may recall, clarifying that we are going back to the DSIC process for this year. And in general, last semester we came to our district-wide student improvement council, which is the district-wide site-based committee. It has parents, community members, business partners, elementary teachers, secondary teachers, district staff as ex officio members, non-instructional staff members that all make up this committee. And they had the opportunity to review our current calendar. We brought calendar option A, which is a replication of this year's calendar to the committee and said, Take this calendar back. There are obviously legislative requirements. You know, look at it, mark it up, do whatever you want, talk to your campus and communities, and come back with any other options. And if those work and they're legislatively compliant, we'll bring those back to the DSIC this semester for a vote. Uh, in all, we had three additional calendars, calendar options B, C, and D, that were created by the committee and brought back for a vote. Um, all of the DSIC members received those calendars, received associated detail in terms of the number of minutes that may or may not be added, the impacts to the teacher workday, um, any other associated details. And they had an opportunity to share that with their campuses and communities before they came back for a final vote. And then uh, earlier this month, the DSIC came back and they actually voted on calendar option B, which was a calendar created by a representative from the District-Wide Student Improvement Council, and that is the calendar that's brought forth uh, for the board to uh, review, and that's the recommendation from the DSIC. Since I don't have kids in the district, I'll, I want to make sure that there's been a lot of parent involvement. And has there been? I mean, is there, is there a way to gauge that? So the DSIC has eight parent reps uh, and four community reps that are represented on the committee. Uh, and then certainly um, any of our DSIC representatives that are teaching staff had an opportunity to go back and talk with their campuses or communities and get input uh, on the process. Do you know if any of the campuses shared these calendars with their PTO or, if, or did they just share with the possibly just the teachers. And I, if I remember correctly, we all had them laid out and after we had learned about them, we could go vote and then. Right, um, there's, there was not instruction given to any DSIC representative on okay. how to share or how to come up with or how to create. Uh, but again, having representation from all of these stakeholder groups, uh, the intent was is to go out and talk with your community, talk with your campus, create the options, and then when you get the final options to come back for a vote, make sure that you're sharing that with the appropriate individuals. I have some questions. Um, is the calendar option B for this year substantially similar to the calendar option B that was presented in the survey last year? Uh, to be honest, I've not gone back and looked at calendar option B from last year, but in general, yes. It is an addition of minutes um, to both elementary and secondary, and if I recall, it was either 15 or 20 minutes that were added to calendar option B last year, and so it is very similar. Um, last year, the district did come up with the two recommendations just based on previous input. This year, calendar option B was completely recommended and created by the DSIC. So there were some questions that I asked you and you graciously helped me figure out the minutes and we did the math together, which I appreciate. Um, but I'm going to ask you those questions now just in case the, the public, uh, so they can benefit from it as well. One of my questions was uh, that on calendar option A, there's basically there's 1,268 instructional hours. And then calendar B has 1,283 instructional hours. So there's 15 more instructional hours in calendar option B. So the, the question that I posed to you was, why couldn't we remove, instead of elementary going uh, an extra 10 minutes, why do they have to go an extra 15 minutes 
and that has some consequences that you you explained. Right, absolutely. I think I think one it's important to recall that the differences between calendar option A and B is that B was recommended by a DSIC representative, which is why they came up with those specific minutes. If you were to look at calendar option C or D, you would see far fewer minutes added, um, and then the vote reflects the opinion of, of those different calendars. But specifically um, to your questions, the differences between calendar option A and calendar option B is the calendar option A, which is very similar to this current calendar, uh, has one bad weather day built in. So, for example, if there is an ice day, uh, we, will, we will not have to make that day up. Essentially, after House Bill 2610 a few years ago, the commissioner really no longer offers waivers uh, for a bad weather day or an ice day because all districts have the flexibility with their minutes to uh, take care of that, with the exception of, say, Hurricane Harvey. And so you're seeing one day in calendar option day uh, A, whereas you're seeing two uh, makeup days built into calendar option B. So that's one of the additional days of minutes. The other difference between calendar option B versus calendar option A is that traditionally in Lamar CISD, uh, our elementary teachers have utilized the first two half days after the first two nine weeks grading periods to have parent teacher conferences, to go through paperwork, and to input grades. And that's been a long standing tradition. There's been a recent change at the state requiring all half days to only utilize high quality PD through a waiver process. And so when you have the additional minutes built into calendar option B, you have additional flexibilities to offer teachers that time to still have those parent teacher conferences, to still have the opportunity to put those grades in. And so when you think of a half day and a half day, that equals that second day. And so when you talk about two additional days of minutes that were built into calendar option B, one would be an additional bad weather makeup day and the other would equal two half days for that purpose. And you said that if we didn't have the, say we had two ice days mm -hmm. a year, but we use our current calendar, which just has one bad weather makeup day, then we would need to either tack on minutes to the end of each day until the end of the school year, or come, uh, I guess it would be like May 28th, it would be the day after school is supposed to end, which then means that teachers would need to potentially come in on Saturday, right? Absolutely, for their, for their right. Staff. So one of the things that we also do in these calendars is we still put bad weather makeup days for planning purposes for our community. So let's say that if we had one bad, bad, bad weather makeup day, but we had two ice days, we would have to make that one day up. So looking at the calendar um, here, that would require students uh, to come back on the 28th, and then staff would have to come back on the 29th to make up that work day, a work day makeup day. So having two days gives you a little bit more flexibility uh, for any sort of inclement weather that may arise. And then another question that I had that you were able to clarify for me was that on Good Friday, so on uh, Thursday before Easter, there's a, a student staff holiday, then there's a DMA day on uh, Good Friday. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you, if you don't know what a DMA day is, that teachers would have to come back, but that's not necessarily the case. Right, so DMA Day is unique to Lamar CISD. We've had a lot of feedback over that over the years from our staff. Um, they enjoy having that day on the calendar. DMA requires you to have, um, I believe, eight hours of professional development time outside of contract time. So by placing DMA Day on Good Friday, which is also a student holiday, um, you have to have that complete as a professional staff member by February, which is before Good Friday. So by and large, you have essentially no employees coming back. Now I say you might have a handful of employees who are not going to renew their contract or they may not come back. It's a very small few who might still have to have some sort of uh, solution to that, but there are online options. But talking with um, our staff development director, talking with HR, traditionally no one comes to work on Good Friday. And the reason you see the bad weather makeup day being the day before is that we don't want to make Good Friday a bad weather makeup day, which is why it's marked the day before. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, this, this proposed calendar, it seems like one of the purposes of it for whichever member of the DSIC created it was so that way we end school earlier. So instead of ending in June, we're ending March, or I'm sorry, May uh, 27th. Part of the reason that I think a lot of folks like that is that it matches up with other districts in terms of the end time. Um, but a lot of the other districts around us, like Q 
KDISD. They're a district of innovation, which means that they don't have to make their school day longer. They can start before the fourth Monday in August. So I know that this was brought up last year, um, but has there been any consideration to doing that process? And I know it, it is a process. And what would that look like? What would be the advantages? What would be the disadvantages? Yeah, so the district has traditionally looked at district innovation in the process. One of the big things we wanted to keep in mind was is that it's a five-year um, exemption, essentially, for the district. And this past summer was actually when the initial adopters came up on their fifth year. We wanted to see what um, was going to happen at the state level. And it turns out that they are going to allow folks to renew that process. They have to essentially go through the DOI process again. But we wanted to see, was this a five-year pilot program? Would it go away? But we have continually looked at District of Innovation. And by and large, looking at our peer districts, the only thing that they've actually had any adjustments with would be the calendar. And we feel like, by and large, we can make a lot of the different uh, adjustments that DOI offers already within law. And so um, we've certainly looked at it, um, but there are some components such as educator certification, teacher contracts, class size, uh, and some purchasing requirements that can be included in DOI. And so we're also aware of comments around concerns that if you go through the DOI process, what other exemptions are you asking for looking around at around um, educator certification and those things. Um, but um, we have not looked at that uh, process. At, it's, it's a process that would take anywhere between five and eight months to complete. Um, and if the district were interested in doing that, it would be something that you would begin immediately in anticipation for the year following the upcoming year to implement. Um, I have a couple of questions if there's no one else at the moment. Um, I know one time, this is going to be for a question, I promise. Um, we did have a bad weather day and we weren't able to make, we didn't have to make it up because the kids had enough minutes, but I think we got either a waiver for the teachers or we did something for the teachers. Would calendar B still not have enough minutes that if we had a bad weather day that we didn't have it available? Would the students still not have enough minutes? Since we're starting, we're going to try to end earlier. So the two different, so in calendar option B, there would be two bad weather makeup days built into the calendar. So if we had one or two inclement weather days, ice days, snow days, um, flooding days, uh, we would not need to make those up. We would have a, a substantial amount of minutes to where um, we would not have to make those days that up. Third one, is right? What I'm saying. Okay. If there was a third day um, and we did not receive. Um, some type of an exemption or waiver from the commissioner. Again, it would have to be something that perhaps impacted all of Region 4, uh, like, a, like a major hurricane or flooding event, uh, and the commissioner might look at it. But if it was one day early in the year, two days later in the year that only impacted parts, it could result in uh, us making it up. And that's one of the things when House Bill 2610 came out a few years ago, Districts have local control over the minutes. You have some flexibility, and there's a lot of neighboring districts who have added additional minutes into their calendar for this reason. It's one of the reasons why we already had at least a day built in to this current calendar, because it seems like at least every other year there's some type of ice day or inclement weather that impacts the district, and folks really don't want to make that day up if they can avoid it. Um, have we looked at the minutes that other uh, districts around us, are we comparable? Or are they less minutes in a day or more minutes in a day? Or do you know? You know, since House Bill 2610 uh, and the District of Innovation, it really is a wide variety of minutes. I would say we did look at some Region 4 school districts, and on average, uh, our high school secondary campuses are about five minutes lower than that sample group and our elementary campuses are about eight minutes lower than that sample group. But again, you've got some districts that have 20 additional more minutes at the elementary level, uh, 15 more minutes at the secondary level, and you have some that are aligned with us, some that might be five minutes more. Um, so you see a little bit of everything. Any other questions or comments at this time? Go ahead. It's always bothered me in the minutes. Uh, because I'm trying to figure out what is the purpose of the calendar. Instructional-wise, it has nothing to do with the kids. Am I correct on that? 
as far as trying to figure out this schedule that has nothing to do with the instructional part of the of the kids' education? Well, I think that um, the associated bell schedule that goes along with this calendar and when you start and stop could impact the instruction. So, for example, um, adding additional minutes um, to the day, you have more instructional time before we have state assessments. Um, you might have more time uh, prior to uh, April when those assessments go on. And so there could be instructional impacts based upon your bell schedule. To the bell schedule, because I think we talked about that last year. What impact did 10, 10 minutes really have on the students, the educational part of it, as far as extending the day to the evening? Um, the other question, in here you say two built-in bad weather makeup days mm -hmm. without using designated makeup days. Mm -hmm. So we have makeup days in addition to these two days? So on the calendar, um, you'll see that we marked two days as makeup days. And that's, again, for community planning. So let's say we have our two built-in days. We're good. We don't have to use them. But we had that third day. As a community member, you can already know, and for planning purposes with your family, you can see that there's a bad weather makeup day on the calendar for April 1st and another one for May 28th. And so that's in place for all of our calendars. Okay, because I was looking at there's four in there. Well, no, what we're saying is, is that right now, if there are two inclement weather days on calendar option B, nobody's coming back to school to make that up. But if there is a third bad weather day during this year, we have the option to either use April 1st or May 28th as the designated day to make that up without having any other adjustments to the calendar. Just another question out of curiosity over the years. Uh, why have we ever had President's Day off? Did we, did we change it to MLK at any point in time? Mm -hmm. it used to be Since I've office. been here in 2012, um, we've not had President's Day off. We haven't had that in a while. It's not been. No. Yeah, once upon a time. I just noticed this year the majority of the school districts were off. On President's Day, we were one of the few that were not, and I was asked, and I didn't think, but, you know. And, you know, some folks do President's Day, some folks do Columbus Day. I know for um, Lamar CISD, a lot of folks do Columbus Day, but we maintain Fort Wayne County Fair Day. Based upon, that's a unique one that you know KDISD doesn't take off, or some other districts in Region Four don't take off. Um, so every calendar is a little bit unique. And then another question from parents, and I even had this over the years. Why do we have January the 4th off, that Monday after we've been off for two weeks? Okay, so um, uh, it's required that there is te the teachers have um, a work day and staff development day prior to uh, instruction in that second semester. And so you have that one day, they come in, they get their PD, they have their, their work day. It's usually split half and half and then our students come back. That's a requirement. You'll see that on every calendar for all districts across the state. The first day back. The first day back, you can't be the Sunday first. Sunday. Yeah. Okay. And um, that makeup day on May 29th, do you really think that somebody would come in there, come to school if we had to make that up, other than some of the teachers? It's a makeup work day. So that's a, yeah. So that day is a makeup work day. So that's again, that's again only if we hit that third day. There's no other um, state relief. Um, teachers would be required to come in on that day or to use a day, one of their personal days, non work days, etc. <laughs> Are we good? We have mm -hmm. all the answers to our questions. Well, I'll go one more no, time. Yes. Yeah, no, no, you're fine. Though, we are, if we approve this, we are increasing elementary to end at 255. Yes, ma'am. Right. And, and it's secondary at 340. Yes, ma'am. So if we're getting phone calls or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. The next item we ask the board to vote. Oh, no. Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> to approve the, the uh, Tennis Boundary Committee's recommendation to establish the Tennis Boundary area for Tamarack <coughs> and allow grandfathering of fifth grade 
students for the 2020-2021 school year, and the committee will actually do a presentation on Thursday for the board. The next item, we ask the board to approve the uh, attached resolution uh, to create a police department and provide the superintendent of schools with the authority to file the necessary documents with the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, negotiate and sign any necessary MOU, and approve any police department procedures as necessary. Okay, we're going to pull that because I some questions, and I assume I'm not the only one. Go ahead. No, we don't have to be pulled. Let's go. Just, just, oh, just, just, just all right. what, what question do you have? No, no I'm sorry. Um, yeah. One is like a general governance question. Um, keep your finger here, but on page 59, for instance, of this board book, there is an item to that the board president signed. So I'm wondering, going back to the police department, why the superintendent is the one negotiating and signing the contract to the MOU and not the board president. So what, what's the criteria used? So um, when you're creating a police force, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, and if you're looking to do that in a timely fashion, it would be a lot of work to continuously come back to the board to sign all of the paperwork and in a timely manner. If the board's interest is to move forward with establishing its own police force, delegating that authority to the superintendent allows him to take care of all the necessary paperwork in a timely manner and not get bogged down in special board meetings or doing it over a three- or four-month period where you could condense that schedule and move more expeditiously. I understand that about the police department. It seems like when we go through these board books every month, some things the board president executes and some things the superintendent does. And after nine months, I still don't understand how that what the criteria is for, for either one. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's just a time thing that and, and again, the board is authorizing. So the board is still taking action on the item. You're just authorizing the superintendent to go ahead and go in and, and execute. It's like we do with personnel in the summertime. Okay, so getting back to this item, uh, the police department, what happens to the security officers? Are, are they moved under the police department? No. So currently we have a two-tiered security uh, force where we have um, a contracted service with SROs and we have SSOs or school security officers, which are district employees currently. And there are some flexibilities that um, our SSOs can do some different things that a certified peace officer cannot. And so um, during this transitional phase, we would continue to have our SSOs uh, and SROs. But we authorize the police department, let's say. And in the future, the security officers will not be under the police department. I think. I think that that I might not make it. Yeah, but I don't think or, organizationally, yeah, um, during the transition, uh, the anticipation is that we would have SROs and SSOs. So we have a set number of SSOs or school security officers in the district. We would maintain those individuals as part of our security or police force. Uh, and so how that looks, um, obviously we have some time to work with the board to see where that group falls under, if they fall under district administration, if they fall under um, a future police chief, et cetera. And, and one of the things there is the flexibility, again, of those uh, uh, security officers. They're, they're, they, they, they don't have to operate exactly like the, the, the police officers as far as going and opening lockers and supporting in different types of ways. And we don't know whether or not if they come under the supervision of the police department that they would be connected in that way. And that's a decision that we're going to have to make as we go through this because I, I for one, would recommend to keep them separate if we're going to have to be in a situation where their hands are tied and how they interact with kids, kids on the campus. Yeah, I, I like that. I, I didn't understand for a long time the, the role they play in the school. I, I, I love the role they, they play in it and the flexibility they have compared to the, the officers. Good um, anybody else can jump in here and have a question. 
Okay, okay, have another <laughs> timeline. Um, there's a mention somewhere in here that not everything can be completed to get an August 1st startup would possibly be pushed to January 1st. Mm -hmm. And is that, as opposed to September 1st or October 1st, is that just a, a clean slate with the new semester, new year? Yes. That's the reason. I understand yeah. the need for that, but I also understand the situation with the city council and the current police department. I think that there's no reason to bump it to January. If we can't get it done by August 1st, I think I would recommend that we get it done by September or October 1st. The heck with the, the smooth transition in the new year. And ultimately, this is a tentative timeline. Um, I think you see here an anticipation to try to get as much done by that August date. Uh, but ultimately, um, the board would be apprised of how where we are in September or October, um, and we would see where. I think the key is to get it done correctly. Absolutely. And uh, uh, we're, we're very fortunate that uh, uh, Rosenberg allowed us until July of uh, 2021. Uh, we don't feel like it's going to take us that long. Uh, but we do feel like that having some flexibility to be able to, because we've got 15 different municipalities that we uh, interact with in the, in the entire district, and we may have to deal with MOUs with each one of those. We don't know until we get started into the process. But uh, we feel like that the timeline that we have uh, shared with you all, that uh, we should be able to make that timeline. Uh, but uh, at the closer we get to it, and if we can't, then I think that would be the, the appropriate time to come back to the board <coughs> and uh, have the discussion that you're talking about. Well, as far as employees or personnel are going to have to make a decision, you have to give them some sort of date. You can't just come That's in and say, all right, Monday we have a police board. Yeah. 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 No, but I was just thinking, if, if we can't get everything done to have it properly in place by August 1st, Personally, I don't see a reason to say, okay, we're, we're going to shoot for January 1st. If we could say, you know what, we could do this by October 1st. And that's that's my point. One, I think man, that, one I, man's opinion. I think we are giving ourselves some room. I think that's really what, because uh, we could very well come back and say that we can get this done by October. But uh, we would rather make sure that everybody, because there, there are a lot of people impacted by this, especially the oh, officers. Yeah that they have a comfortable feeling that we're moving forward with this and they have a general idea of when it, how long it's going to take. So at least they would know that if for some reason we were not able to make it in August, that by January we're going to have it done. The goal is to meet this timeline that we have proposed to the board. We just don't want anything set in stone right now. That's correct. Okay. Well, yeah. Nobody wants a separation. Any other questions? Uh, I had a question about when the hiring of the police chief would fit into this timeline. If you know. Uh, uh, we're working on that. Okay. TBD. <laughs> Um, so on page 39 where it says, whereas the Texas legislature has also authorized Texas School Board of Trustees to authorize commission police officers to carry weapons. Um, and then under number, keeping that in mind, and then under number five, under the be it for the resolve, it says uh, that the superintendent would approve all law enforcement policies and procedures. So that's with the exception of whether the officers can carry weapons. No, with, or is that not the same category? What this resolution does is that uh, the board is um, giving the superintendent the authority to carry out any necessary paperwork, documents, memorandums of understanding with these multiple municipalities to create a police force. So uh, five is really talking about it's giving the superintendent the flexibility to carry out the board's wish of handling all of those uh, details. Okay, so it would always be left up to the boards to whether they carry the weapons. You can speak. Some of this is required language in terms of if you're a commissioned peace officer to carry a weapon. So this was certainly vetted by our attorneys. But when you're talking about the firearm piece, that's that's obviously a requirement of a law enforcement officer. Yes, and the the, the section you're talking about, that's a requirement, legal requirement, and the language that has to be in there. And it's in there because 
police officers are required to carry a weapon. Do you have a question? Go ahead. And I'm going to jump back and forth, but just what you say that <clears throat> when we get our own police department as a school board, we don't have much control over them because of all the legal aspects of it. If they're doing something we don't agree with, what what is our role going to be as far as being over the police department itself? The, the policies and procedures governs any law enforcement entity. And in addition to that, there's also a set of, of um, uh, commission rules that the Texas Commission puts out. And so all police departments have to abide by those sets of standards and those those commission rules actually carry the same weight as, as a, a legal standard does. But you would be able to review and adopt and modify any of those policies just as any other board would. Okay. Yeah. Um, my understanding, we, we still have an agreement with the city through this coming year, school year. <coughs> but right here, what we're doing is we're starting and trying to get this in place before the school year starts. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The contract. Uh, we have to give them 30-day notice. They and I'm going 60-day notice. Six, 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 six. They gave us notice. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't really. I'm trying not to say what yeah. my comments are, but uh, we'll wait till after this. Um, What's the question then? You brought me off the phone, yes. Um, when, if we do do this, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is the policeman, the guys that are actually working right now, will be put in a dilemma <coughs> because we're going to be asking them to make a decision to come and work for us while they're still working for this department while we still have a contract with them, with the city. No, I think when you look at the timeline, what we're trying to do is set up um, – some tentative dates so that all the law enforcement officers who might be interested in applying for that have the time to make that decision. And so that's why we have all of the timeline dates set up for an August transition. And if we don't make that, we have the backup of a January transition. Uh, but certainly um, we have a good working relationship with RPD, and they've given us plenty of flexibility to make this transition. Um, have y'all – I'm sure y'all have, but I've got to ask it anyway. Other districts that have their police departments, uh, y'all have spent time with them to see what issues they've been having or you know, pretty well prepared? Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with several uh, uh, police departments that have been started in, in ISDs, and I've met with several of the chiefs that started those police departments. And did they have contracts with other people while they were trying to make the transition? Some of them started as, as uh, contract SROs like we have and have made a similar transition, yes. So you know for, they've got lessons learned they told you about? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I have one quick one. So you will have a chief in place at whatever time, and that person will help you decide, go through the hiring process, though? Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Thank you. Next item, we ask the uh, board to uh, execute a retail sales interlocal agreement for electricity with TASB Energy Cooperative. And we provided uh, uh, a contract at your table. This is one of those uh, uh, bills that uh, we can't identify the exact number until it is uh, approved, and then um, and they hit the button, and then that's the number that we get. Uh, for those of you that have been on the board before, you know we've done this uh, years back. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, that the board approve the design development for the multi-purpose spaces 
and orchestra editions as presented by PBK. And President Danziger, members of the board, and Dr. Randall, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Lauren Pargood and Mr. Mike Mandola with PBK Architects. They have prepared design development drawings for quite a number of schools to share with you this evening. You may recall board policy requires them to secure your approval before they can proceed to complete the construction documents issue for permits, bids, and construction. So we'll be asking for your approval Thursday night at the board meeting. But in the meantime, they have the presentation to make for you this evening. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Randall, thank you for your time. Um, like to, we're very excited tonight to present the, um, again, this very long title, the uh, multi-purpose <laughs> rooms at um, three of your high schools, Foster High School, George Ranch High School, and Fulcher High School, as well as orchestra room additions to Wertheimer, Westendorf, Poly Ryan, and Navarro. Um, as well as at Foster, we will be adding 176 additional parking spaces for students at Foster High School, which you'll see in a minute, as well as um, replacing stage, well, adding stage curtains because Navarro currently has a folding accordion partition. So adding stage curtains and upgrading the, the sound and the lighting at uh, Navarro Middle School. And just a quick thank you of the team, um, Jim Rice and Doug Walker Rice with Rice and Gardner for helping us set up everything. Um, we've had multiple meetings with uh, Ram Estrada. We've had multiple meetings with the, the principals at each other campuses as well as some of uh, the campuses we had the music directors from those campuses sit in on the meetings so we could locate the, um, the spaces for these multi-purpose classrooms and these orchestra rooms. Um, so just a quick summary, uh, the multi-purpose spaces at the high schools, again there were three of them, uh, there are 2,000 square foot additions that we've added on and that does not account for the circulation space that was added. So the multi-purpose rooms themselves are actually 2,000 square feet. Um, and those multi-purpose rooms are just what they say multi-purpose, so they can be used for both extracurricular activities as well as instructional um, and outside use. And Mike will kind of take you through the floor plans in a minute so you'll see how they're set up. The orchestra room additions, um, again, they're 1,800 square feet. If you've been to Roberts Middle School, very similar setup. Um, just meeting with Ram and his group and the principals at the campuses, you'll see just some slight changes because it was a little more discussion um, from from Robert. So similar, used for the same purpose, orchestra room additions. You have your office and some storage space. Um, again, like I mentioned, we, we're adding some student parking at Foster High School and then Navarro Middle School. So I'll let Mike jump in and walk you through the floor plan. Uh, Madam President, trustees, Dr. Randall, uh, good evening. Uh, so we're going to start here with uh, Foster High School. So you can see um, there is an infill parking a uh, lot addition for about 176 spots on the north side of the campus. Uh, the multi-purpose addition is on the south side. And looking at a composite plan, it's at the end of the existing Main Street corridor. So we'd be extending that corridor out and adding the multi-purpose space there uh, neighboring the uh, existing gym. We have a conceptual rendering of what this might look like. So we need the mass of the uh, multi-purpose space would match uh, what's next door in the gym, and we'd, bring, we'd be bringing out a one-story corridor space um, to access that. Uh, moving on to Fulcher, uh, the multi-purpose space addition is in the uh, back of the campus. This is back by the uh, existing gym. And... Um, the existing, there's an existing open air porch on the back, so we would be enclosing that and making that a secure vestibule. And we'd be extending the corridor over and adding in that multi-purpose space there. Um, and you'll see in all these renderings, we'll be matching the existing language, we'll be matching, matching the existing palette plan, of course, to make it look like it's all it belong there. Uh, George Ranch. Very similar. It's exact same location at the uh, back by the uh, gyms. Again, a secure vestibule. And we'd be keeping the existing card readers on the existing door, adding card readers, 
And the purpose for this would be that the multipurpose space could be used by third-party entities after hours without getting access to the rest of the school. Again, matching the language, matching the uh, material palette. This is a conceptual rendering of what that would look like at George Ranch. Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, where Hiram Middle. It's there on the south side of the campus. And we would be extending the Main Street corridor. This is the typical layout you'll see at all four schools. Uh, but we essentially have one um, orchestra room. Uh, we have instrument storage both in the orchestra room and separate. We have a small office and we have a flex space. And talking with the various principals and with uh, RAM, uh, this flex space could either be used as a practice room or it could be used as extra storage. And uh, several music um, instructors there wanted to be able to circulate through the space for unloading. So we've added double doors so they could basically circulate uh, around back to the orchestra room. Uh, for Wertheimer, uh, we wanted to, they wanted to keep the existing door, the second exit door, out of the existing band uh, so that um, teachers could help monitor the two spaces. And here's a conceptual rendering of what that would look like. Moving on to Wessendorf. Uh, very similar. It's at the end of the Main Street, but I also wanted to highlight uh, Westendorf is one of the few places where we had some site constraints, so we would have to move the existing drive to the service yard, like 15 feet. It's not that, it's not that much just to maintain that access. Again, uh, an extension of the Main Street corridor. Uh, same overall layout and also maintaining the, uh, the secondary door from the band so that the teachers could help monitor the, uh, each other's classrooms. <coughs> Conceptual rendering is what that would look like, uh, bringing out that uh, one-story corridor space and next to the high volume uh, orchestra room next door. Uh, moving on to Navarro, this would be on the <coughs> excuse me, on the south side of the site. This is up by the existing band area, and then also wanted to highlight this is where the uh, the stage is that we have. Uh, various stage improvements, including curtain, sound, and lighting. Same overall plan, uh, just slightly different corridor configuration to get there. And a conceptual rendering of what that would look like. And then lastly, uh, over at Polly Ryan, this should be on the south side. And we have, I'll show you why in a second, but we have a, a longer corridor to get to the same overall plan. And the reason for that is there's an existing mechanical louver up there used to access that mechanical mezzanine. So we want to keep that. So we have a one-story uh, corridor to access the orchestra room that doesn't uh, get in the way of that, that louver. Okay. Just going back to the plans, if you can go down. Um, the, the campuses that are all similar, like Fulcher and George Ranch, those multi-purpose rooms ended up in the exact same location. Um, Foster was a different one, but it ended up pretty much in the same location, which was next to the gymnasiums. And then also looking at the uh, the middle schools, all of the orchestra rooms ended up right by the band hall, by the band room. So all the fine arts and noisy areas there are going to be away from all your instructional areas. So. We found the perfect places, again, just working with the with RAM and with all the principals and everything, we found the perfect locations just to make everything fit and work perfect. Like Mike said, just matching the architecture of the buildings so it'll look like it wasn't just a, a Band-Aid. It'll look like it was built along with the original construction. We'll match the architecture. So it kind of worked out very well. Uh, just a project schedule where we are today. We're presenting to the board workshop tonight. Uh, we hope to come back to the board for a pre uh, for award of a CSP to a contractor at the May board, and in June, once school's out, we look to get on campus and start start some construction up. Any other questions, concerns? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam President, the next item we ask the board to approve environmental solutions. 
for hazardous material survey, <coughs> excuse me, services for Lamar Junior High School additions and renovations in a total amount of $1,545. You skipped page 55. Did I? I'm yes. sorry. I was looking for the words. <laughs> okay. Now we're asking that the board approve uh, Charlie Calcomy <laughs> surveying A. Jones and Carter Company for professional uh, typograph typographic surveying for the Jane Long Historic Gym renovations in the amount of $2,250. And I've already shared the next item on page 59. Page 63, we ask that the board approve environmental solutions for hazardous material surveying services for Lamar Consolidated High School additions and renovations in the total amount of $1,100. Next item, we ask the board to approve traffic engineers for the traffic study for Lamar Consolidated Complex in the amount of $27,800. Page 71, we ask that the board approve Terracon for the geotechnical study for the Lamar Consolidated High School and Lamar Junior High School additions and renovations in the amount of $32,000. Page 85, we ask that the board approve environmental solutions for hazardous material surveying services for the recladding of the Brazos Crossing Administration Building in the amount of $670. The next item on page 89, we ask that the board approve the donation deed of 0 0.0193 acres or 840 square feet to the city of Fulcher for the expansion of Huggins Road. Do we have that here that we can show it on Thursday? Do we have that? Uh, Do you have that queued up? No, no sir. No. Do we have it on Thursday? We can have it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. To show the board where. The actual. It, it is in it's in the book. It's in the book. Yes, okay. On page 92. But yours was so much easier to okay. <laughs> We can get it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The next item on page 95. We ask that the board to approve uh, winning way services for Texas Accessibility Standards Review and Inspection for the multi-purpose spaces and the orchestra additions in the amount of $9,525. Next item on page 124. We ask that the board approve winning way services for building code compliance review, the multipurpose spaces, and the orchestra additions in the amount of $4,900. The next item is on page 141. We ask the board to approve Charlie Calcomy surveying. A. Jones and Carter Company for professional uh, type of typographic surveying for the Lamar Consolidated High School additions and renovations in the amount of $8,875. Next item on page 146. We ask the board to approve winning way services for Texas Accessibility Status Review and Inspection for <coughs> Lamar Consolidated High School and Lamar Junior High School additions and renovations in the amount of $3,150. Next item, we ask the board to approve the deductive change order number one in the amount of 
$1,387.52 and final payment of $45,711.10 to Millis Development and Construction for the Foster High School Athletic Improvements. Next item on page 158, we ask the board to approve the purchase of interactive flat panels, television installation, hardware services, and electrical work in the amount of $646,146.75. Madam President, those are all of the action items. On to information items. On the, uh, actually, the demographic uh, update will be done on Thursday night, and uh, the Lamar uh, uh, CISD Whole Child Safety and Wellness Model update. Will be on Thursday night or tonight? Oh, come on. We can do it tonight. Come uh, on. She looks ready. I'd rather. <laughs> we kind of want to. I don't know, being the last at the end of a, of a board workshop or presenting right after lunch, I, you know, that's an enviable way. place to be, let me just tell you. Um, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to give you guys an update and uh, share um, some of the good things, some of the opportunity areas, and, uh, and collaborate and see how we can help our kiddos. So um, let me see if I can work this thing. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just share um, an overview um, of the model timelines just to bring those of you who haven't seen this uh, presentation up to speed. Um, some of the core components, how our multi-tiered system of support works, and then some of our data points, recommendations, and quite honestly where we are at this point in, in our process. So... We initially um, shared this with the board in March of 2018. I can't believe it's been since then um, that, we, that we had that presentation. Um, then came back in May of 2018 and did a final presentation at which the board um, approved the model. Implementation began in August of that year, and we provided a March update in 2019, and here we are in February 2020. So in the core components of, of the model, and we'll get to a graphic depiction, but I just wanted you to think of two very um, distinct buckets, if you will. So a three-tiered system of support, tier one being general access to all, and then we'll see a graphic of what that looks like. Tier two, directed and focused intentional supports with either individuals or groups of, or of individuals. And then tier three, which are really the most intensive customized supports. In that model, there are six pieces of the pie, if you will, six core domains, and that's social well-being, emotional well-being, environmental well-being, mental health, a growth mindset, and college and career readiness, and they are all equally important. So here, here, is, here is the graphic that you'll see. So our six core areas of equal significance are resting on um, the foundational Tier 1 element of a comprehensive character education um, program, which is Character Counts. Um, and, and if you'll remember in the timeline, when we rolled this out, um, our strategic plan hadn't been finalized, and yet this model completely supports um, the safe and healthy environment part of our, of our strategic plans. If you think increased mental and emotional health supports and resources to improve social and emotional well-being, um, ensure disciplinary interventions consistently address root causes of behavioral issues, and then <clears throat> ensure that all facilities provide a safe and inclusive, effective learning environment. So if you look at the first tier, our tier one, our baseline components, these are the things that all of our children um, have access to. So the model calls for greater school counselor access, um, character counts in our character education program, uh, school guidance, PK through 12, a mindfulness resource you probably have heard um, in, um, in the literature and, and out uh, in the area of mindfulness and breathing and meditation and how that helps with our students regulating, uh, regulating and, and emotional support. College and career exploration and advising. Our student services app, which provides uh, direct access, 
access, excuse me, to our Hope Line, to um, anonymous bullying reporting, um, and to Crime Stoppers. Youth mental health first aid training for all of our teachers. This was huge for us. And as well as trauma-informed classroom training for all teachers. Now, actually, again, our model was rolled out and well underway when this last legislative session happened. And um, this uh, actually supports compliance with House Bill 18, House Bill 114, House Bill 165, House Bill 126, and Senate Bill 11. We look now at Tier 2, Directed and Focused Intentional Supports for Targeted Students and Population that Support Self-Efficacy and a Safe and Supportive School Climate. Again, these are just a little bit extra support. So things like individual, individual counseling based on student need. Um, counseling groups um, provided by the school counselor, again, based on need, but just to give you an idea of what those may look like for anxiety, depression, life changes, grief, self-esteem, anger, academic performance, if you will. Our mentoring program, our LAMP mentoring program, um, getting off uh, a little slowly, but we are, we are gaining steam uh, this year. And um, our affirmation project. So this was something that was really awesome when we looked at our data. And those transitional grades from fifth grade to sixth, sixth to seventh, eighth to ninth, and then those ninth graders. And we saw some dips um, in some um, some behaviors, maybe some self-harm behaviors and, and just adjustment behaviors. And we said, how can we build some self-efficacy within these groups? How can we um, build some self-esteem and some camaraderie as they transition to that next grade or that next school? And so our affirmation projects were born, and it's where students have the opportunity to understand the gift of kindness directly. And so when you're able to personally affirm someone and have them realize that you've shared that gift of kindness or, or um, um, support, kids, it, it's amazing. It's amazing the look on their face. You don't have to be rich to be kind. And that holds huge value and, and worth for them. Um, behavioral RC, R, excuse me, RTI supports through our solution-focused technique, techniques platform platform. Jeez, I'd like to buy a bell. Goodness gracious. <laughs> um, anyway, this um, is a research-based, evidence-based program that um, allows our counselors and our administrators to respond um, to behavior concerns in a very proactive and positive way because it builds on internal locus of control for kids. We build on the resiliency that they currently have and where they are able to be successful. How are they able to be successful and how can we replicate that in other situations? And then our, obviously our partnerships with the Memorial Hermann Clinics for the Red and Blue Tracks um, and supporting um, our homeless students and um, our parenting teens across tracks. Then we have multi, our, our third tier, um, tier three, and this is our most intensive, and this is where you'll find our HGI support, our therapeutic um, support for our kiddos. And actually, one-third of LC LCIC campuses have direct access to, to therapeutic support. So either there is a counselor that is on-site, or we use a hybrid model of on-site therapy as well as teletherapy in some of our, in some of our high schools. Um, <clears throat> All LCIC high schools have access to therapeutic support, and Houston Galveston Institute um, has 13 therapists within the district. Our red and blue tracks also receive therapeutic support through the Memorial Hermann Clinics, and two of those, our two clinics actually serve 18 campuses. So, some numbers there: red track schools for the Memorial Hermann Clinic, just to give you an idea. Um, through January, um, there were 412 mental health um, visits, and on the blue track, 361 um, visits. So when we were putting the model together, we looked at these sort of key da data points. Our LCISD fragile student data, which are data that we collect for um, students that have self-harming behaviors, whether that's suicide ideation, um, non-suicidal self-injury, so um, self-harm, and then um, homicidal uh, ideation. We looked at our historical data on student loss of life um, and, and where do we see those, those, um, those happening. 
counselor time allocation. Again, where are counselors spending their time? Um, how are we utilizing that resource within our building? Campus feedback. Uh, looked at discipline report, uh, referrals, and then looked at some national trends from the um, National Center on School Mental Health, on American School Counseling Association, on the Texas Counseling Association, and just some best practices that were out there. And here's where we are um, as of year two. When we presented to the board, we presented a five-year plan um, to sort of get us in line with some of those best standards and, and what we would like to see. So for year two, um, so far for this year, we've been able to um, meet the recommendation for our high schools, our non-title high schools, to at least meet a 1 to 550 ratio for counselor to student and also support with a therapeutic or an LPC on site. Our, non our um, high schools 1 to 400 in our title tracks plus an LPC, we've been able to, to do that. In junior high, non-title tracks 1 to 550. In junior high title tracks, 1 to 400. In our middle, middle schools, um, non-title and title tracks, uh, 1 to 500, but that middle school would also have therapeutic support. We've been able to do that. And um, bring our elementary schools, um, at least at 800, they would get a new counselor or an additional counselor. So we were, were able to do that. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. Um, and we have done some amazing things to get our student counselor ratios down. Um, we, as the five-year projection goes, those will go down, but you sort of have to eat this elephant one bite at a time, um, so to speak. And so when you think of the model and you go back to the tier one and the baseline and, and what's accessible to everybody, um, some, of the, some of the places where we've hit some, some bumps is um, delivery of guidance in every classroom at least one time a month with fidelity. Um, so we're getting there. I, I've spent lots of times reviewing guidance lessons, and you know they range sometimes from 15 minutes to 30 minutes, and that's 30 minutes is the is the goal. Um, but we are we are absolutely in the in the process of working with those administrators to help make that time so that we can have that, that guidance that is really, because it's, it's not just a lesson, it's an interaction. And it's an opportunity um, to inform and engage our kids. Um, conducting small groups based on need. So our counselors have a lot of duties and the opportunity to um, actually execute um, groups has become challenging. So the other duties that they have are, are really becoming problematic for them to be able to do that. Um, revised counselor duties to facilitate proactive posture of support. That was one of the things I'll never forget, Ms. Danzinger, when we, when we rolled it out and you're like, okay, so what are we going to do with, um, uh, how are our counselors going to be able to do this too, right? Um, and so we've had two years of really munching on this challenge. Um, I, 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 we haven't... We haven't eaten it yet. Um, it's still because there's no substitute for the human interaction. There's just there's no program you're going to sit a kid in front of and have them um, relate. And our interpersonal skills with our kids are, are a little challenging right now. So um, it's a people thing, and trying to figure out you know how we're going to um, facilitate that. We haven't come up with that quite yet. Um, and when I say have planned purposeful follow-up each week, um, the goal of, of that part of the model was that not so much have you turned in paperwork or somebody failing or whatnot, um, but to have that, again, personal interaction with kids that you know what's going on in their life and you have no reason to touch base with them other than they just need that little extra, hey, I remember you had that going on, how's it going, and that connection. But you have to plan for that. Um, I'd love to say it could just happen, but you do have to sort of plan for that. Uh, behavioral RTI support training, that's in progress with the solution focus, which is fantastic, um, and being able to train just counselors. We've had an opportunity to train administrators, um, which is, has been very well received. 
And then trauma-informed classrooms, that's actually part of the legislation as well. And I'm in the process of being trained in TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Interventions, which is the, um, like, youth mental health first aid is the absolute pinnacle of being able to train um, in, in that area. And TBRI is that as well. And so in April, I'll get a practitioner training and then be able to come back and train all of our counselors who then can then be a resource on all of their campuses and training their teachers. So... Some of the additional um, supports and highlights. Um, Dr. Masaj um, has been amazing at having consistent meetings to review our data, um, our, our fragile student data, to see what um, what is it telling us? What is our kids' behavior trying to tell us? And how can we respond to that in a, in a proactive way? And so reviewing data points on a regular basis for a timely response um, directly led into number two and adding two more family support specialists for the red and blue, blue track to help um, with stress family systems based on need. We saw behaviors and we saw um, um, schools that were really struggling um, with some of their students and we said, okay, let's see if we can't support that. We added a full-time HGI therapist for George Junior High, which is what we, we discussed a little earlier. Uh, training for administrators on character counts that happened at the beginning of the year. Solution fr- focused training for counselors and administrators. Um, new teacher youth mental health first aid required trainings for onboarding, so as part of our sustainability of being able to do that. And then overall, we've added 11 new counselors to meet the counselor student excuse me student ratios for um, year two. Are y'all okay? <laughs> Busy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's a, it's a lot. I have a couple questions. But I need questions. Okay, when you say that one of the areas they're really having a hard time with is creating small groups of children with needs, but that doesn't mean they're not pulling them individually if they are needed, if a parent or a teacher or even a child, because my reference is, of course, is elementary, that a child could put a note in a lot of counselors put a thing a box outside their door. When yeah. So, Miss Danger, I, I can honestly say with a great deal of certainty that if a child needs to see somebody for whatever reason, um, that child's going to take priority, and the paperwork will come second. It's just the paperwork is still there, and so whenever that happens, and, and um, you know, it it. it we worry about burnout and things like that. Yeah. But our kiddos come first first and foremost. I, I so Absolutely. Good. But the small groups helps putting them in a, to see others have the same. Yes, ma'am. And, and also just um, uh, to create healthy coping strategies. Right. Instead of, um, you know, our, our kids go to the Internet for all that wonderful sage advice um, <laughs> that, that isn't so sage, uh, but really to help. Um, with very healthy, uh, healthy um, coping strategies to whatever bump in the road they're dealing with. Have the uh, counselors come back and giving you some feedback of how we as a board or administration can help them get to where you want them to be, or are they just treading water right now trying to keep their head above? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> um, they are. You know, there have been a lot of really, really smart, wonderful people trying to figure this out and um, trying to get to a point to where we can be in a proactive posture as opposed to being in a reactive posture all the time. And maybe we won't need so many Tier 3 supports if we can get Tier 1 shored up and and really going well um, because they don't have the time to pull those groups that we feel are so important. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. So you're saying, so when we check the boxes for the student counselor ratios, we get a lot of greens, but then we have the plus and minuses below. So you're saying we're working on a plan still for that. So is it more resources that is part of that plan, or what what are we lacking in your professional? (laughs) People people um, to, to shoulder some of those um, administrative duties, really. Because, again, 
if, if there was a program, if there could be something. We, we um, last year tried to um, ask some of our administrators to shoulder some of those responsibilities, and we almost did them in. They were, they were I mean, just the most amazing people that put their heart and soul, but it was, it's, it's a lot. So you need more people to help with the bureaucracy of the whole thing. So really, it, it's, yes, a compliance, um, compliance paperwork, so like, like special work. education referrals or, or 504, things like that, that are non-counseling in nature, um, but are very important that have to be done right and to be done well. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the two bigger buckets, if you will. So to do that, how does that happen? I mean, who, who snaps their fingers and hires more people? Well, I don't think we snap. Um, I think we, I mean, we look at we look requesting it from you, and it, and it goes up the chain in the command. How does how do we, how do we get more people? It's a recommendation. It's been the recommendation of the model since its inception. It's just, um, you know, as you well know, I, I see a very small piece of the pie, and so there's a there's a lot of things that a district needs, and so just prioritizing and and what does that look like um, is where that where that begins. I, I, the recommendations have been there, but there's lots of people making recommendations for probably the same dollars, you know. Did, did you, is that what you were going to say? I didn't, I didn't. I was just going to say is that when they come and uh, a lot of us are looking at, this is just the budgeting season in which when we look at positions and we recommend it, and Dr. Roberts is – uh, clear on the fact that there's a lot of different recommendations from many different departments. Um, and so um, there's a process involved in doing that. And I, I'll help with that a little bit. <laughs> because at some point, as this board will see, you will get a lot of recommendations for staff. If you approved all of them, uh, we would be having a big issue financially. So at some point, you take and look at all of them, and you make a determination where are your priorities. This was one, and as you saw, we made some progress on that. And so as well, what Dr. Roberts was saying earlier, uh, she is going to advocate for and should for her program. Uh, but she's one of a number of them. And so to ask you a question, there is no snapping of the finger because when we start snapping the finger, we could be broke in a pretty quick time if we're not careful. Yeah. And so uh, uh, a part of that, we will come to you with the budget, and this board will have an opportunity to establish the priorities <coughs> and, and also uh, all of us being held accountable for the decisions that we make. Dr. Roberts and her staff uh, and, and the team, They've done a really good job with what they have. Uh, in fact, she's been asked to serve on, I think, a statewide committee because they're finally figuring out that this is a model program. They've done one heck of a job, and we know that we've got to continue to do more of that, as well as, uh, you know, our Caption Kids Hearts program, for example, where teachers are connecting more with kids that is an extension of the counselors. They can't counsel the same way that a counselor can, but they certainly can uh, help to uh, identify kids that need issues because they're connecting with them and then send them over to those, uh, the, the counselors for support. So that, that would be uh, uh, my response is that uh, uh, Dr. Roberts' job is to tell us what she needs, and then our job as a, as a whole is to take and put that on the same table with everything else. Does that help? Yes. And we have made, in two years, amazing progress. So we just amazing. have to keep looking at the positive. Absolutely. Lots of positive. You have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I know we've discussed this year and year, that the counselors are having to do the paperwork, that they're not actually having time to do the kids' kids. And we've always questioned how can we change that or help them. Do y'all use paraprofessionals in that in this field to help the counselors? As far as a, a paperwork part, well, I'm just trying to figure out if sure. there are other ways that you can get people to come in and do that responsible work so that the counselor can spend time with those children. 
you know, we haven't gotten that far to look at what level of um, uh, expertise would be needed. Um, uh, some neighboring dif districts have um, uh, compliance coordinators, different different things, but we'd have to look to see what what is um, required. You know, I, I certainly with uh, confer with Ms. Mathis on you know for the compliance because those are those are federal programs that absolutely have to be. Um, done with fidelity. So uh, it would be based on recommendations of what level of expertise would be needed. But I don't have an exact answer for you on that. And there are some. I happened to work in a district where they had uh, uh, individuals specifically trained to relieve some of the paperwork off campus. So that, that certainly is uh, sub something that can be uh, uh, looked at. But there's nothing, as, as Dr. Roberts mentioned earlier, there's nothing that beats that one-on-one -on -one personal contact with their counselor. There's and nothing that beats that. Uh, you mentioned briefly, Ms. Mathis, this all ties into special ed, too, doesn't it? A lot. This program? I, it, well, it, it really is. some of the students that you work with? It's everybody. Okay. It's, it's, this, is, this, this, this model is, is for all of our babies, all 35,000 of them. <laughs> There are a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um, I'm so proud of you. In the last two years, this is a great report. And um, I still have concerns uh, that these counselors still have to do that extra paperwork. Uh, and I hope we can find a way to help them along a little bit. Thank Are there you. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Um, Dr. Dr. Roberts, thank you for the presentation. I was looking yeah. forward to it, and I think it's incredibly important work, so thank I you. appreciate it. Um, when you were speaking with uh, Mr. Welsh and then Ms. Kay, you mentioned the compliance and the paperwork. Is a lot of that, are, are the counselors typically the ones responsible on a campus for overseeing the 504 program? Yes, sir. So is a lot of that paperwork 504? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do any of the campuses have a, a separate 504 coordinator? No, sir. It's all the counselors. Um, a separate question that I had was it, the Character Counts program, that's pre-K through 12? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I have a, a good idea of how it works on the elementary side. <laughs> um, what does Character Counts implementation look like on the secondary side? And um, a, a second part of that question just following up on the presentation we received, I believe it was a couple months ago, was that for a while our secondary suspensions were trending down and they're starting to potentially trend back up. And I know that some of the numbers might be a little bit off as a Hurricane Harvey and so it might look like it's up a little bit more than maybe it really is. Um, but are there other, in addition to character counts, are there other types of restorative discipline practices in secondary campuses to try to reduce that? Yeah. All right. So let me start with first. Sure. So in secondary, uh, there have been some phenomenal discussions around the pillars. And I'll just use the last one. Um, I was actually at a sixth grade campus and um, then a very similar one at a junior high campus where they took the notion of fairness. And they had a great conversation. They juxtaposed it against um, bias, favoritism, and discrimination. And said, so what do those look like to you in your, in your world? And then what does fairness look like against that? And then how do we show that if we experience the others? And the engaging conversation that these kids had as it related to their own world was fantastic. I mean, it wasn't somebody saying, this is fairness. You should do this, this, this. It's like, no, we want to bring it down to where it's relevant to their world. Um, and, then, and then the conversations, um, they're, they're, they're much more lively because it, it matters. So you'll see that um, across the board in, in the lessons. Um, it's really, they really try to bring it down to what does that look like in your everyday world as a 16-year-old high school student? And are those lessons always carried out? Uh, you know, the aim is to have them carried out monthly by the counselors, or do teachers build that in, or administrators do lessons? Yes. 
Yes. No. Um, for the most part, the counselors deliver the lesson in the interaction. The beautiful thing when we were able to train um, a little over 500 t- teachers in character counts over the summer and then all the administrators was that they were then able to see how can I integrate this language and integrate um, this really just way of being in LCISD in my classroom, in my conversations. So it's not, oh, that's a character counseling. Before you know it, you're like, you know, that's very trustworthy of you. Or that you, they, they, they'll say those sort of things now. Um, so, yes. And so the goal, again, there'll be character counts training this summer for teachers as well to, again, train as many as we can so that that integration, it just, again, becomes part of our culture. And then, okay, suspension. <laughs> so, um, so we do have restorative practices um, in some of our schools, but the solution-focused techniques um, are really, and there's lots of research around this, are really gained to look at kids as instead of behavior being about compliance, our behavior is trying to tell us something, and we got to figure out what that is. And so instead of it being about compliance, it's about a teachable moment It's about helping kids find their own resiliency that they all have and then choosing by by just looking at where they have been successful to utilize some of those same resiliency um, areas that they have and apply it. Now, that doesn't mean that's the absence of consequences, but it de-escalates and it empowers our kids and before you know it, they're choosing the behaviors, the de- desired behaviors that we would like, and we're not telling them. They're telling us already how they've been able to be successful. So that's really just starting to take hold. And um, actually, we did a, a, an AP, secondary AP training uh, a couple of weeks ago. Then do some follow-up with that, and again, some teacher training over the summer as well. So those restorative practices, are those... Um because there's different models. Are, are they just on a campus level, the principal decides that they want to start implementing that campus-wide? Um, and are there different models at different schools? So there, there are really sort of, and I guess if you think of character counts as just a way of talking to one another, the solution focus key components is just a way, once you see a kid's behaviors are escalated or in a certain way, um, there are certain questions that you ask. It's just a matter of discussion, and it just becomes, again, part of how we talk to kids as opposed to everybody circle up, we're going to have the, the sort of practice circle and that sort of thing. Um, it's going to vary with level of comfort and expertise. Um, that's why, just like with character counts, this isn't going to be a one and done. This is going to be a continual training. And then we actually have, um, based on the counselor training, 12 of our counselors that um, were highlighted by the expert that trained us all initially as having really great skill sets, having a district team that then goes in and supports those campus trainings. Yeah. I was just going to give an example. I asked my son about it. He said, so like an advisory in high school, I believe they'll come in and the counselors do a presentation or they'll kind of do the discussion mm-hmm. and then the teachers kind of follow up later. And, and that works in high school. Yes, and, it, it, and we really encourage that across the board that the teachers are present because when they hear some of that discussion, it really informs discussion later on in the, in the classroom and, again, just reinfuses the message, yeah. So it's not just in isolation once it's introduced. It's across the board. Yes, ma'am. And we really that's, hope that that's it, yeah. when they know it's important. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Is there any other questions? I just wanted to give you a compliment, you and your team and the counselor, because I, and I sent this to you this week, but I thought it was important to say, <clears throat> without getting too emotional, but um, with the tragedy that happened um, in Greatwood last week in Campbell Elementary, <clears throat> Um, somebody wrote on their Facebook account, by all accounts, the LCISD crisis team did a wonderful job with their class today. So I just, it was really important that you were there and you did a great job and that's how people felt about it. So appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any other information items people would like to visit? Well, if not. Madam President, right. I wanted to let you know there were no audience to take. Oh, I forgot. We've been kind of <laughs> skipping around tonight. I'm sorry. You're right. I should. <laughs>
Um, closed session? Yes. Okay, so we will adjourn to closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551.071, 551.072, 551.073, 551.074, 551.075, 551.076, 551.077, 551.078, 551.079, 551.078, 551.079, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 551.078, 